All right, folks, we've reached the end, the last class of the semester. I know, uh, it's sad and happy. Um, so if you didn't get the email, please, if you have a laptop, bring your laptop out, uh, download Docker, and get that running on your computer, because I'm gonna go over uh, probably brief 15 minutes of talking about the web and web vulnerabilities, and then we'll start playing with and a real, realistic web application that has known vulnerabilities, and we will try hacking as a group. It should be fun. <coughs> cool. All right. So one key aspect we haven't discussed yet about HTTP, the protocol. So what were the elements of an HTTP request header? What were some of the things that were required there? Version. The version, what else? The version, <coughs> the type of request, the method, get post, head, whatever. What else? The type. The host, so you have the host name. What else? Number and then the header that we saw that was required is the host header. The question is, when you visit, let's say, Facebook.com or <coughs> Google.com, how does it actually know who you are? How does it know that you're the same person that made a request a week ago? Because what information does the server have to identify you in what we just said, based on the method, the URL, the host that you're accessing, and the version. What do they have to identify you from that? Yeah? Nothing. Nothing. Well, they have a little bit more. They also have the IP and TCP information. So they know your IP address, uh, the source IP, the, and the source um, port. But in a big network like ASU's network, we're all actually going behind a single NAT device. So um, our IP address would be the same, so if a website was using that to identify <coughs> you, that would be very bad. Yeah. They probably know what OS you're using and what you're using. Possibly, depending on the user agent field, but that's an optional header. It doesn't have to be sent. The key problem is how can you make a complex, really cool web application if the web server acts like somebody with amnesia, where every time they see an HTTP request, they go, oh, new HTTP request, great. Here's the page you're looking for. And then you click on a link and they go, oh, new person I've never seen before. Here's that page you want. Right, continually over and over again. Um, and so this is actually a nice thing about HTTP because it is stateless. It's nice in the fact that it's simple. The downside here though is that, well, if you wanna actually, most applications you interact with, you want to create a session with them to interact multiple times so you can log into the application and then they can give you access to different things based on who you are in that application, right? All the things we talked about, about authorization and authentication and access control. But with HTTP, there's actually no built-in mechanism to do that. Um, so we need something that allows us to do authentication and there's three main ways this is done. You can kind of fake it by basically when you access my site, I'll put some hidden information in every URL on that page I generate just for you. So that way, when you click any of those links, that will get sent back to me. Um, the main way though is this is done using cookies. So uh, what are cookies besides delicious? <laughs> yeah. They're just like little bits of info that you store like with the browser and they're usually associated with like single like. Yeah, so the idea is Basically, the website needs to have some way to ask the web browser, hey, store this little bit of information, and next time you talk to me, use that information so that I can identify you. Um, so cookies are basically name value pairs. The server will add a set cookie header in order to ask the browser to save this information. 
in the HTTP response, so you can set a cookie of user equals foo, and then the, the browser will, on each further request, add a cookie header that will have this cookie. So that, that way, um, I can say, hey, your user, I, well, I maybe like this, I can say your user foo, and that way, every request that you make, I can look at this cookie value to see what user you are. Uh, servers can do multiple cookies. Um, if you do something like curlgoogle.com, you'll see that they actually ask you to set these really complicated cookies here. Um, and these are actually much, you know, uh, actually pretty complicated. Uh, there's all types of things you can do in here about setting how long the cookies are valid for, what path of the web application they're valid for, so on and so forth. We're not going to go into all of these details. Um, so the user agent is supposed to follow all these directives to expire cookies when they're expired, restrict cookies, but the browser can delete them at any time. Has anybody cleared out their cookies from their browser before? Never, you've never done that? You clearly never called the support line because that's like the first thing they tell you to do and you're like, this is dumb, there's no way this is gonna actually do anything. Um, this happened to me like last night. Uh, so, but what's the key? So when the web server gets an HTTP request with a cookie header, what security guarantees does it have about that data? So think about it this way. I'm a web server. You're a browser. You send me an HTTP request, and in my response, I say, hey, set cookie user equal to foo. And then the next time you make a request, you set a cookie you send this header, cookie, colon, user equals foo, what security guarantees do I have about that data? None. What was that? None. None? What does that mean? So Break someone, it down a little bit. Someone can actually copy that cookie and use it in your same browser, and then it authenticates them for you or the user. Yeah, so fundamentally, I have absolutely no trust in this data, right? This cookie data, um, you as a user could change it from foo to admin, Still the same as it comes to me. Um, all I see is user equals admin, and so I go, oh cool, you're an admin, that's nice. Um, you could give this cookie to somebody else. Somebody else could uh, inject a piece of malware into your computer to steal this cookie, and so they can then log into the website as you. Um, so using cookies in real life is actually quite difficult, and you need to use either encrypt encrypting some value here or using an HMAC or one of the other things that we talked about, it, at least so that that way users can't forge their own cookies and create their own cookie values. Cool. So now that we have this, now we can actually build web applications. So previously what we talked about is we have this client with a browser, we have some web server, and then the client makes an HTTP request to the web server. But now, instead of the web server just sending back static HTML content, we have some backend web application that the web server talks to and says, hey, here's this request. And the web application's job is to generate HTML, which the web server will then send back in an HTTP response. So how do you rob a bank? Guns. I don't need guns. If you use guns, then uh, you're looking to up your sentence when you get caught. So how do you rob a bank? Has anybody watched a movie? Ever? Stick up the teller. Stick up the teller? That's the first thing you do? <laughs> well, Man, you're going to get caught. All right. <laughs> what else do you do? Scope the place. You what? You scope out the place. What does that involve? Uh, watch guard changes. Cameras are there. Checking out their Wi-Fi. Yeah, so you perform some kind of reconnaissance, right? You say, who works at the bank? You try to identify every single person who works in that bank. What's their role? Who's the bank manager? Who has keys at the bank to the vault? If you just stick up the teller, the teller's gonna be like, I have $100 in my till. Like, what do you, so take this money and then go to jail. Like, they don't care. What you want is that money that's in the vault. And you need to know who has keys to that vault. And even more so, when are they working? Because if you rob the bank when the manager's not there and doesn't have the keys, you're not gonna have a, well, you're not gonna at least, your reward is gonna be much smaller. What's the guard schedule like? When do they take a break? When do the guards change? Why is this important? Does 
is useful information in your bank robbery? Well, you try to find a time when you're going to have the least amount of uh, resistance to what you're doing. So if it's during a guard change, this could be a time you catch something off guard. Yeah, or maybe one, maybe you have some of the guards on your payroll, and so you know that one, the other one always takes a break at a certain time of day, so you can target that time. What does the layout of the bank look like? Have you guys seen Ocean's Eleven? They like build a replica vault. <laughs> like that's exactly what they're doing here, is building the layout of the bank so they know it like the back of their hand and they'll know where everything is, right? Um, what does the vault look like? What kind of lock does the bank use? What kind of security mechanisms are in place? How does the bank's alarm system alert the, um, uh, alert the, uh, the police when they're being robbed? How does that work? Can you cut off that communication? Um, all kinds of stuff. And this is actually, even in the movies, you know, they show it as like a montage sequence where they're like sitting across the street at a coffee shop with like sunglasses and a newspaper, um, seeing who works there. But it's, it's a very critical part because if you don't understand the bank, you won't actually be able to successfully infiltrate it, right? And the other steps kind of vary off. You build some kind of crazy elaborate plan, everything goes wrong, and you probably end up in jail as most of the movies. Or somebody turns you in or something. Like Usually you don't get to step four. Um, so don't rob banks. But the question is, can we use that mentality to rob a web application? So when we think about that, we're thinking about penetration testing and how can I find vulnerabilities in a remote website? And the steps are actually almost identical. Where you first perform reconnaissance, you wanna understand as much as you can about how, what that application does and how it functions. How does the application work? Are there user accounts? Do those user accounts have different privileges? How are the privileges enforced? Maybe you can get around the privilege enforcement. What does the layout of the web application look like in terms of URLs? Um, does the URL structure have something? Does it have like a slash users or slash home? And maybe you think like, oh, what if there's a slash admin that just happens to be world uh, open? Uh, what URLs should only be accessible by a, a certain privilege? So this is actually a uh, pen testing I did a while back was on a website that handled credit card transactions. And so you could see your history of all the credit card transactions that happened for your business. And what they used is it was a PDF and there was just an integer number in the URL for whatever, 1000.pdf. So we're like, hey, what happens if we put in 1001? And it showed us somebody else's bank statements and credit card transactions. And so we were able to enumerate that to get all the transactions from the last like six months to a year for that, that that company had ever processed. Um, yeah, they were not, I mean, they were happy that we found that, but uh, they were a little bit sad that that happened. But if you don't know and understand the application, you won't understand what happens when you mess with, um, mess with things. This is why I think in the, one of the first times I did like a, uh, a challenge type thing where you have access to the server and I say if you get root, you get a bunch of extra credit points. I had some students that didn't quite understand what that meant, and so they uh, did like ls-la slash and showed me like, look, I can see the root of the file system. Like, ah, that's not quite what I meant. That's, that's where you need more reconnaissance to understand the application. Like, should you be able to see the root of the file system? Yes, otherwise you won't be able to do anything. Um, what's the input? What's the output? And actually, a thing that you're trying to do is understand how is this web application probably written? So this is why oftentimes some of the best pen testers are former web application developers. They developed applications. They understand what are the things that I would be lazy about doing when I wrote this web application. Uh, so you can kind of think of like, oh, did they check this thing? Because I know that's always a problem. Then your next step is to develop some kind of vulnerability hypothesis. So you want to think like a scientist. Right? Not like a robber. You're trying to think, oh, what? So for instance, going back to that example, huh, what would happen if I changed this ID number? Would it show me somebody else's uh, uh, credit card statement or not? And so then you want to test that hypothesis. And so actually, I think the first time we did this, so we had like a URL with like an ID of 1,000. And you tried 1,001, and it gave you a 404 error message. And so. You know, the hypothesis was, oh, that would give us somebody else's um, credit card statement. 
but it gave us a 404. And now the question is, okay, what do we actually derive from that hypothesis? Well, it could be either that it's not vulnerable, or it could be that there exists no report with the ID 1001. So we tried up to, I think, uh, like 1010, it took like five or 10, and then we hit some PDFs that were not ours, and so we were like, yes, this is awesome, this definitely works. So then you develop some exploit, and then you profit, because you need to um, not only be able to say, hey, I, you know, there's a big difference between saying, I think there's a vulnerability here, versus saying, there is a vulnerability here, and here's an exploit. Like what we showed them was, hey, here's all your um, credit card processing reports of all these different companies for the last six months. They were like, okay, okay, that's, that's a good, uh, uh, good thing. Um, my advisor tells a story, they were doing pen testing for a bank, a web application for a bank in Brazil, and they were hired by kind of like a middle manager, like not a super higher up, uh, because the company didn't really care about uh, computer security, but this person who hired them did. And so what they did is they went into this meeting and basically knew who was going to be at the meeting and told each of them their bank account information, like how much money they had in their accounts at the bank. And that definitely woke them up to the fact that like, oh, not like, oh, you have a SQL injection in your application, blah, 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 technical jargon, blah, blah, blah. They were like, no, these are your bank accounts. And by the way, if we wanted to, we could transfer that money to our accounts. Um, and so that's why developing an exploit is an incredibly important part. And then the profit is uh, mostly in terms of if you're doing this for as a profession, that's part of your job. If you're doing this on the side, you should only be testing bug uh, websites that have bug bounty programs, so you can do so successfully without actually going to jail. Oh, I suppose I am missing a slide. Uh, there should be a slide about how to do this without going to jail. So you don't want to end up like these people and go to jail. You want to actually make the world a better place by fixing security vulnerabilities and getting uh, rewarded for that. So the short version is don't hack anything that you don't have permission to hack. So you can hack into my server because I gave you access and I gave you all the okay to do so. If you're pen testing, you need a letter from the company with, that is signed with like, which is called your get out of jail free card that says that you, um, that they hired you for this, and in case anything happens, that's kind of your ticket out. Um, the bug bounty programs now are awesome. There's HackerOne, there's Bug Crowd. Many popular websites have bug bounty programs that say, hey, if you abide by these rules, we'll pay you if you find something as long as you tell us about it and don't violate these rules. So Facebook has that. Facebook will even give you an entire fake uh, Facebook network to work on, like a fake test network, so you can create accounts and try different kinds of attacks out. Um, so do that. So when thinking about reconnaissance, we need to think about in terms of injection vectors, thinking about what are all the ways that attacker-controlled input can make its way into the web application. And so any place where user input goes in the application. So from what we've looked at, what are some examples? What was that? Login. Login, so form data. So any data coming from a form? What else? Yeah? Even just like the URL. The URL itself. We can, uh, attacker can make, it's actually one of the key things that's different from a web application versus a traditional binary, is you can access any URL at any time. Right, it's up to the web application to stop you, whether Whereas with, let's say, like an Android app, you can't just force it to go to some page that's not currently up in the GUI, right? That doesn't even make sense to think about. But a web application, you can try to request any possible URL. Um, so query parameters, the path, post parameters, anything else? Cookies. Yeah. Cookies. Cookies. Yeah, we just saw cookies, literally any header data. So all the header data that we send, uh, we didn't talk about the referrer header, which if you look very closely is misspelled, but this is a header that tells you what site you came from, so that a web application knows, uh, and websites know kind of where you came from. Um, sometimes this data goes into logs that are viewed by admins, which could have SQL injection or cross-site scripting vulnerabilities with them. Uh, so this is another place. Any files you can upload. Maybe even other websites. So this is part of that reconnaissance phase is understanding 
what does the web application touch and where, where does it get data from, right? So if you see, oh, this web application is using some tweets and wow, it's not using like an iframe. Looks like it's pulling those tweets in from a backend somewhere. What happens if I try getting tweets into there that are malicious somehow? And that can change the data. Um, emails, all this kind of stuff. So we're going to start playing with Wacko Pico. So Wacko Pico is an intentionally vulnerable web application that I wrote <coughs> for uh, my master's project at Santa Barbara. And the idea is it has, oh God, actually, no, I don't know. I think it's 16 different vulnerabilities inside of it. Um, spread throughout in different types of vulnerabilities and also behind different types of crawling challenges. The idea was to test, well, how good are automated vulnerability analysis tools? So there exists a whole category of tools that you point them to our URL, you click go, and they'll try to find all vulnerabilities in that URL. Um, so once you have now this test site with this, um, with known data, you have ground truth, and so you can uh, we can test and see how well the scanners did. So the scanners did horribly. Um, they not, let's see, total, they didn't find more than 50% of the vulnerabilities, and that's grouped, so like all scanners union together, and a single scanner didn't find more than 40% of the vulnerabilities, so it was very interesting results. Uh, so we're gonna play with this. So if you've got Docker, you can run this Docker command, and then access it here. How many people, successfully are able to install and run Docker on their system, and then can run this command, and then can access the URL through this localhost. Cool, all right, just a second. I think it's this one, yeah. Has anybody been able to do it on Windows? There's like weird steps on Windows where the forwarding an error? Yeah, okay, that may happen. So I think there's probably enough of you. That it's nice, so the problem is I, I stood up one instance that's publicly available, but basically you'll all have access to that one instance, and so when one of you messes it up, it's gonna be messed up for everyone, and I have to reset it, so it's super annoying to do that. Um, so this is great because when you can get this to run, you can just run it locally and test to your heart's content on uh, this nice, yeah, so it's the website. So if you can get it up and running and you can access it here, you should play with the application because what we're gonna do is we're gonna take about 10, 15 minutes, play with the application, then come back together and talk about what does it do, right? So think about that reconnaissance step. We want to do that. For everyone else, you can use this URL I stood up. I didn't, I didn't give it a domain name, but I don't think I can make this, can I make this big? Uh, you can't see that. That's nice. All right, there we go. Let's take. Cool. I'll be walking around. If you need help? Raise your hand. Make sure you can go here to get to this page and start playing around. You need the Docker stuff too. So these are the Docker commands. Or the top one's the Docker command, and this is where you go after this. So.
run it. If you're running on Linux, you gotta use sudo first. So <laughs> Mac, you don't have to do that. <laughs> I never put a silly down. I've got the Docker running, then um, I would be using my the hello, right? The, the loopback hello, that would be the kind of the network if I'm connecting the local host. Yes. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. Yes, 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 if you want to see the traffic. <laughs> thing won't like tell you that it's ready. I guess maybe I can do that at some point, but it does something like this. It does like, hey, I've started. This is actually a supervisor day, it doesn't matter, but it's running the
Discuss. Okay, so what do we know about Waco Pico? Yes. It's a PHP app. It's a PHP application. How'd you find that out? Uh, there are .php pages. Mm. So it could be a PHP application. We actually didn't talk about it, but you can basically move URLs around so it's not actually PHP, but yes, that would be a definitely a good indication that it's PHP that's executing. Anybody else? Nothing else about this application? Yeah? Uh, well, it's kind of a piece of vulnerability, but there's a link to log in as an admin on the bottom. Mm. So I can add an admin to the page. Let's wait on that. We'll, we'll separate functionalities from vulnerability, but we know as part of functionality that there's an admin uh, console, right? It's a different part of the application. Yeah. One more thing on the PHP thing. There's yes. Also so oh. it just prints that out to you. Interesting. Okay, so we definitely know it's PHP on which page? Uh, if you go, to, if you're in the admin panel and you try mm -hmm. to change it today, uh, if you intended that, otherwise maybe you're just like a feature issue. Okay, so we have this admin link here. So we see there's an admin area. What else do we know about this application? What did it do? Images, what about images? You have to log in. So how do you create an account? Register. So I can say foo. Foo bar, password foo. Create an account. So upload pictures, I can look at pictures. I can, what else can I do? What was that? You can buy pictures, you can add them to your cart, and then you can remove them. You can continue the confirmation. Well, that's not a lot of times I would do this. You can purchase them. Look at all this. I'm so rich. What else? Anything else? Yeah. If you go to like your uploaded pics. Mm -hmm. Where, in which, oh, you're uploaded here? Yeah, interesting. Um, let's, so, yeah, it's more, yeah, the reconnaissance, yeah, you're trying to think about like URL structure, so um, we'd want to verify somehow that this is our user ID, right? That 12 is our user ID that we just created. Uh, purchase does not have that, which is kind of interesting. That's something that's um, guestbook, carts, has a logout functionality. Right, so you can log out, log back, log in, foo foo. A search. <coughs> cool. All right. The uh, I definitely. So there's two main web vulnerabilities we're gonna learn about today. One is SQL injection. The other one's cross-site scripting. SQL injection is. More serious in terms of when you have a SQL injection, as we'll see, the capabilities that allows an attacker to do are pretty significant, but they're not necessarily as prevalent. Cross-site scripting is much more prevalent. The idea is actually SQL injection comes back to what we talked about about altering parsing. So it's all about um, so web applications store usually state instead of in the file system in some kind of database. Um, it can, SQL injection can allow somebody to steal all the data in your database, alter your database, and, and um, 
um, change the contents of your database or bypass the login. So you can see here, really, I mean, confidentiality, uh, integrity with altering the database, and there's actually a third one where sometimes they can delete your data, so that would be availability. Uh, really, really bad vulnerability. And the problem is, fundamentally, that web application, so we saw that component in our diagram. This PHP code is generating SQL queries to send to a SQL server using some code that looks like this. So we didn't go through all the syntax of PHP, but everything within double quotes is a constant string. So it's, and actually this isn't even PHP, this PHP concatenation is with a dot operator, which is super annoying. But you have select star from users where ID equals, and then a single quote, and then concatenate that with whatever's in an ID parameter and concatenate that with a single quote and then a semicolon. So what's this used for? Let's say, for instance, like in our, our nice, um, the example we found of our purchase pictures, right? Maybe it's trying to figure out what are all the pictures that this user has purchased. So if the ID is, let's say, 10, right? The PHP application is just concatenating strings, right? This is what you've been doing since learning Java and C and everything. It's literally just putting bytes together, right? So the result from this, from PHP's side, is gonna be select star from users where ID is equal to 10. Now, when the SQL server sees these bytes, it has to interpret this and say, what SQL query did the uh, developer want me to execute? Well, and so it parses it, right? It parses it according to the syntax of a SQL query, and then it interprets it based on the semantics. So that's what this coloring is. It's, it's gonna basically say, oh, it's the select keyword, so select all columns from the users table where the ID column is equal to 10. And so the SQL server will be like, great, I know how to do this, this is a valid SQL query. I'll query the, the users table and return everything. And that ID is equal to 10. And what did the developer, based on this first line, what did the developer, what's the intention here of this query? Or to, I mean, if you look at it at a high level, what it's looking for is give me everything in the users table where the ID column matches this specific value. And if we assume that IDs are unique, this should always ever return one value or one row, right? Now, what happens if we put something else in here? What happens if, let's say, we put in the ID is negative one or one equals one? So what's going to happen in the PHP code? fake PHP code. Is it going to do anything different than it did in the previous case? No. It's just concatenating bytes. The idea is it's concatenating this constant string with whatever this ID is with this final constant string. So we'll get the we'll get this value which is going to be select everything from users where ID is equal to negative one or one equals one. So what then the SQL server is looks at this, parses it, is this a valid SQL query? For people who've done SQL? Yeah, it's a valid SQL query. It's 100% valid. What is this probably going to return? Everything. Everything? Nothing? Those are two very different answers. <laughs> Somebody want to go in the middle, like half of the things, every odd thing? So why? Which one's correct? I think all of them. All of them? Gonna return what if this one is always true? Where ID equals true? Yeah, 
so just like in your programming language, if you have a uh, characters enclosed by single quotes, <coughs> actually that's standard SQL. You can use double quotes, which is my SQL will do, but most SQL uses single quotes. So it's going to treat all the bytes in between those single quotes as a string. So would you expect, let's say, if you had uh, a single quote in like a Java code that if you had negative one or one equals one, that would somehow evaluate to true? If it's inside of a string? No, right? These are just bytes. Right? It's tricky because it looks like it should evaluate to something. The problem is that syntactically, SQL will treat everything that's inside of single quotes as one string value. So it's going to say, are there any I, are there any rows in this users table where the ID column is equal to the string negative one space or space one equals one? That will probably return what? Nothing. It'll probably return no no results. But now, what if we put in ID equals negative one single quote or one equals one? So again, right, the key thing to keep in mind is the PHP side is just concatenating strings together. So it's going to concatenate strings together and go select star from users where ID is equal to this or one equals one. And so how is it going to parse this? I would, uh, your intuition is correct because it's going to be just like a programming language. If you, on a line, had three single quotes, it thinks the first two capture, right? So you have a negative one or one equals one and then a tick. But we can see here before that point, the color of this war has changed. Why is that? It's a keyword. It's a keyword and it's outside of single quotes, right? So now, the SQL server is interpreting that differently. And where did this final single quote and semicolon come from? PHP. It came from the PHP code, exactly, this last part. So can we influence that? Can we just magically get rid of it? some different code than concatenate these three things together, right? So no matter what we put in for ID, the first part will always be select star from users where ID is equal to this with a single quote, and the final thing appended will always be a single quote and a semicolon. Uh, but yes, we can do all, ki ki uh, all kinds of fun things. Uh, one th fun thing is we can use the uh, comment character in SQL, so SQL has a comment um, character, either dash dash or a hash mark. And so now when this string is then passed to the SQL engine, strings concatenated together, interpreted, now everything after the hash is interpreted as a comment, which means we don't care about it for parsing purposes. So now how many rows is this going to return? All of them, right? Because this ID equals negative one will probably fail but we have or one equals one, so that will return true. That clause will evaluate true for everything in the database. And we can even do super fun stuff. So we can put something like drop table users after here, and depending on the settings of the SQL server and the programming language, um, both of these SQL statements can be executed, so we can do a select and then delete your entire users table. Uh, so I really hope you have backups, because otherwise you are gonna have a bad time. We can even insert, so we can inject new queries to insert into the admin table a new username and password. Um, and so the way to look for this is 
And the key concept here is that our input in a SQL query should never influence the structure of the query, right? The problem is our input's going inside of single quotes, which means it should never be possible for the SQL server to interpret our data essentially as code. So how do you look for these things? Well, you can either try to do it passively. If you put in actually one plus two, the SQL server will interpret that as three if it's interpreting that as code. Uh, the main way to do it is to look for errors. So this actually, uh, one of my very first jobs as a programmer was uh, doing this like uh, social network startup thing. But anyways, the funny thing was we deployed and we had a bug report that came in because somebody whose name, I don't think it was O'Malley, but it was a name like this that had a, semi, uh, a single quote in it, uh, completely broke the site and this person couldn't log in, couldn't view their pages, or getting error messages. And I fixed it eventually, but looking back on it, it was a horrible, horrible SQL injection vulnerability. Um, so you can use names like these to actually try to trigger errors because a well, coded web application should never change, I mean, should never error depending on your input, right? It could tell you your input's not acceptable, but it shouldn't trigger an error. So, where could it be possible? Where could a SQL injection be possible? What has to be involved? Database, the database, it's literally in the name, SQL injection, right? If, so. You just explored this whole application. You see all these pages, you see all these parameters, all these form fields. Which ones do you test first? Well, you test which ones are likely touching the database or which ones do you know have to be touching the database. So, let's look for SQL injection vulnerabilities. So we want to cause this, this uh, crash. So we'll do, like, ah, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, we'll do three minutes. So if you had an expiration, make it crash. randomly typing on a keyboard, we should be able to find some vulnerabilities, right? You're even not, you're much better than random monkeys. <laughs> Smart, intelligent humans in a software to compare that.
Anybody get any crashes? think this is doing then? So let's log out. Let's go to the login page. Foo tick bar password. So everyone gets that? See that error message? Right on the login? So it's saying you have an error in your SQL syntax. Check the manual that corresponds for the right syntax to use in your bar tick and back tick password equals SHA1 concat password with salt limit one and line one. So this would be the smoking gun that tells us, man, there's probably a SQL injection vulnerability here. Um, the question is, what? so what can you do? So when we did one tick or one equals one hash, so everyone want to try, wanna try that? So should this log you in? No, right? We think about our options. There's no user with the username one tick space or one equals one. Maybe there is, but that's a separate issue. <coughs> right? But we log in and we get to sample users. So what? <coughs> no, so don't don't remember this site. If we go to uploaded pictures, what's our user ID? One. So likely what happened is we. Let's go back to the login page. Well, first we did one, which means it'll show us the user. No, it'll return all users. What if we just did this? Do we think this would work? Maybe like that? But so previously we could just log in as, as the first user, right? Presumably because what we're doing is essentially returning every user in the database and the code is just choosing one, the first user to log in as. But if we wanted to try to, let's say, log in as user three, that, I thought that was gonna work. So we found one SQL injection. Anybody find anything else? There definitely is one somewhere else. I just don't know off the top of my head where it is. That's why I rely on all of you. I got a sample. I don't know. I'd have to look at the code. play with SQL injection. We can do other type of stuff. We can try to steal data. Uh, let me see. I'll try to get this demo up. Ah, SQL map is going to be installing. Um, so the other app is cross-site scripting. So the idea is cross-site scripting 
occurs when malicious JavaScript that somebody else controls executes in the context of your browser, your window. So we're not gonna go into the details, but there exists a access control policy in your browser called the same origin policy, which basically means you can have facebook.com open in a tab, and you can have attacker.com open in a tab, and that JavaScript code can't talk to each other because you don't want the malicious.com JavaScript code to try to alter or change your Facebook page or add users uh, or interact with Facebook on your behalf. Uh, but if the attacker can trick your browser to execute JavaScript that they choose inside your uh, facebook.com page, then they can do whatever they want. So they can actually steal cookies, perform actions as you, which include uh, on the website, which would mean like friending people, um, sending your money away if this is a, a website. Or my favorite is they can actually do a super sophisticated phishing attack and present, present you with a fake login form. So you're on facebook.com, but what's shown to you is a fake login form that when you fill out the form, your details go to the attacker and not to Facebook. How this happens is actually pretty simple. So it goes back to the HTML parsing we were talking about. So this is some sample, uh, this is PHP-like code, where basically the way to interpret this is everything that's in between this, um, this bracket question mark, everything else is static. So you can think about it, again, it's string concatenation. So this code is equivalent to first output this constant string, and then at this point, substitute. So the equal sign means place in the output whatever the value is of name variable, and then append this constant string. So if the name was just Adam, we would get hello Adam, that would be parsed by the browser, and it would just say hello Adam. And it would look something like this. But if we can include JavaScript tags in our input, we can then trigger arbitrary JavaScript code to execute on this page. And so we can do something like script alert cross-site scripting, which pops up that alert box that you've probably seen before. And again, remember the key thing is that the website is very stupid, the code. It is simply concatenating strings together, sends these bytes to your browser, which then parses it and interprets it as HTML. So the attacker can actually trick you. So if you remember, if we go back, is there any JavaScript code on this page? Is there anything in between script tags? No, it's just pure basic HTML. It's very clear the developer did not want any JavaScript code to be executed here. But if an attacker can alter this name parameter to get the name parameter to be script alert cross-site scripting, now the browser will parse that and say, oh, the developer wants me to execute this JavaScript code to pop up this cross-site scripting alert box. And if we go on this next page, we can actually see that if it's part of this name parameter, we'll see this here. Um, so the idea is basically when I'm doing this, I'm trying to, so the defense against this would be the HTML encoding that we saw uh, on Tuesday. So the ampersand, LT semicolon. If the web application transforms less than symbols to that, then we know we're safe. So there are actually several different places of cross-site scripting in Wacko minutes to find them. So get me one of these. I want to see a box. An alert box. So I'll try inputting things like this. And don't look at the other stuff I'm doing. Let's make this smaller font. See if nobody can hear it.
Hey. Hey. I got something. Yeah. <laughs> Is it the right something? I got uh. Yeah, at least yeah. Uh, if you put that, if you put that back, whatever the change. Yeah, whatever you change your player sheet. Yep. Yeah. 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 Just script and then close script and then whatever it's been, uh, his exact command. His exact command was open brackets, script, close brackets, it's alert, open parentheses, take SSS, take close parentheses. Oh, yeah, okay, close cool. Script. That's the exact command. So now it looks like alert is a specific. Alert is a and whatever you put in in the XSS. And I put that in the search. So now I'm just going to try to find other scripts that maybe there. Beep, beep, beep. We're going to stop it early. Since we're running out of time. All right. Somebody want to be my, I'll be your hands, tell me what to hack? The guest book? For what? what? Which parameter is vulnerable? Actually, the browsers, since I made this, have gotten much better in detecting. So basically, they detect, hey, <coughs> you sent a script tag, and that is exactly what was sent back to us. That looks like a cross-site scripting attack. Uh, we're going to block it. But because, but this still works, we can see by this name here, because all this is stored in the database, so it's a, uh, a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability. <laughs> Anybody find anything else? Just this page? Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, good, good one. So yes, there's a uh, flash. I'm not gonna enable flash on this, but there is flash, well, let's try it. Oh, it does. Yeah, the um, technical reason is that the scanners are very good at identifying basic cross-site scripting. And so something like this test, can they actually execute? Yeah, so this saying it's not gonna let me uh, because of this XSS auditor. Um, but uh, we wanted to test, can they actually execute Flash? And the answer was no. Um, cool. That was good. 
Uh, you need to sanitize things. One thing before we go. All right, so this is about the... Um, so the SQL injection vulnerability that we found seems pretty bad, right? Anybody could bypass the <coughs> login and log in as any other user. But it's actually much worse, as we saw. So there's actually a tool called SQL Map, which will, you can fire at a SQL injection, and it will do things like, um, let's see what it's gonna do. Uh, yes, skip test. So it detects that the back end is MySQL. It looks like it found a um, username as a post parameter is vulnerable to SQL injection. Uh, what does it say? For the remaining test, you want to include all tests for, yes, do everything. Uh, do you want to follow? No. Oh no, is this going to work? I don't know. We'll see. So it's detecting uh, a bunch of vulnerabilities here. Ah, you know what, I don't want to do all that. Uh, no, just do random stuff. No, don't test the others. Okay, so. Uh, this will, all. Oh, there we go, that's what we want. So this is downloading the entire database based on that one single injection. So it's getting all the values. You'll see it doesn't take very long. I mean, it's making a lot of requests, but it's actually going so fast I can't show you the things that it's figuring out. But it's actually querying, okay, you can query, uh, MySQL stores all its, its metadata in fixed tables, so you can query that table to figure out what are all the different databases mm. in your database. Then you can query each database to figure out what are the different tables. Then you can qu figure out, query each table for all the data inside of it. And so, SQL map. It's an open source tool. I just did brew install SQL map. You can do apt-get install SQL map, and you can, uh, so again, do not do this on a system that you do not control. Uh, okay, this is too much, actually. <laughs> All right, so there's too much data in there. We could do... Look at these options. Um, we can do dash dash... Oh, we can do uh, dash dash dump. D, I know it's wacko. This is asking me if I want to save the password to try to crack them to a dic with a dictionary attack. <laughs> so, okay, so let's see. Oh, so now we have Wacko. Ugh. SQL map, output, localhost, dump, Wacko Pico. So this is every single database, or every single table that's in the database. So we have all of the, the users table. Uh, we can see this is every single user, so we know it has an ID, salt, login, last name, trade bucks value, password, first name, created on, um, literally anything we want, comments. So we just got everything from this database. So it's not as dangerous, be safe out there. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's it. Have a good semester. See you all on, oh, I guess, oh god, I hate talking about this. Uh, the final is cumulative. It's going to be everything we've covered up until that point. I don't know, don't ask me anything else. There'll be anywhere from one to a hundred questions. <laughs> Just to tell you that that question's meaningless. All right, we'll be all on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs>